Good evening, good evening. I think we're ready to get this show going. A warm welcome to this, our 16th annual Leon Levy Lecture on Biography. My name is Kai Bird, and I'm the direct, director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I am gratified that Shelby is attending this event together with the incoming interim president of the Graduate Center, Joshua Brumberg. I also want to thank Thad Zelkowski, our hardworking deputy director, for all his wisdom these past years. Thank you, Thad. And also thanks to Wendy DeMarco Fuentes, Karen Sander, Tara McDonald, Molly Yin, Barbara Norsha Brahms, Jimmy Koch, Tim Ellis, and all the other folks at CUNY for helping to organize this event. We are meeting tonight before a live audience, but we are also joined by hundreds of other lovers of biography who will be watching this event via live streaming. Welcome, everyone. Unlike our other Leon Levy events, this e evening is a formal lecture, so there will be no Q&A at the end. Each year, we select an eminent biographer to give the annual Leon Levy lecture to talk about a theme related to the art and craft of biography. I've always believed that biography is not only the best vehicle for conveying an understanding of history and the human condition, but it also happens to be the most difficult and sometimes obsessive of scholarly pursuits. The working biographer is a privileged person, privileged to be able to ponder and write about another human life, and yet it is extremely arduous work, day after day, year after year, and very lonely work. We are detectives and always worried that we might have missed that one last lead that could break open the case. No wonder we become obsessed. We have with us tonight many working biographers, including some current and former recipients of a Leon Levy Biography Fellowship. More than 55 such fellowships have been awarded since 2007. Thank you to Shelby White for that. And uh, some 32, maybe 35 by now, biographies have actually been pub published to date out of this program. That's an extraordinary record. In recent years, thanks to Doran Weber of the Sloan Foundation, we have been able to fund an annual fellowship devoted to biographies of scientists. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our 16th annual Leon Levy lecture, Walter Isaacson. I first met Walter in the early 1980s when he and Evan Thomas were working on their very first book, a group biography called The Wise Men, Six Friends and the World They Made. At the time, I was working on my own first biography, A Life of John J. McCloy, the powerful Wall Street lawyer, who was one of the six friends featured in The Wise Men. So we shared an editor, the legendary Alice Mayhew, and I think we both started out on our respective biographies about the same time. Um, but Walter had a full-time job. He was a reporter at Time Magazine and he and Evan published The Wise Men in 1986. Uh, and on my own portrait of McCloy, but my own portrait of McCloy did not appear for another six years. I have to say that this became a pattern. <laughs> Walter went on to publish a terrific biography of Henry Kissinger, which came out in 1992, the same year I finally published my first biography. He took a little longer to publish Benjamin Franklin, An American Life, which did not come out until 2003. But perhaps his tardiness could be explained by the fact that he had become Time Magazine's 14th editor in 1996. And if that was not a sufficient distraction, in 2001 he became chairman and CEO of CNN, just two months before the events of 9-11. After Ben Franklin, Walter decided to tackle the life of yet another scientist, none other than Albert Einstein. At the same time, he became president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, one of the country's most pre prestigious intellectual forums. 
Around this time, my own wife turned to me and complained, how is it that Walter has these high-powered jobs and he still manages to write big, fat biographies? I think she was telling me something. <laughs> Walter was indeed a very busy man. Nevertheless, Einstein, his life and universe came out in 2007, followed just two years later by American sketches, great leaders, creative thinkers, and heroes of a hurricane. Next was a phenomenal blockbuster biography of Steve Jobs, published in 2011. This was followed three years later by another group biography, The Innovators, how a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. And just three years after this came Leonardo da Vinci, published in 2017. The same year, Walter quit the Aspen Institute to become a mere professor at Tulane University in his beloved hometown of New Orleans. But he was not slowing down as the biographer. In 2021, he published The Code Breaker, Jennifer Dudna, Gene Editing, and The Future of the Human Race. And finally, ju just this month, Walter has published yet another groundbreaking biography, Elon Musk. So there you have it, 10 wonderful, deeply researched biographies in the space of four decades, and every one of them has made the bestseller list. It is an astonishing record of creativity and hard scholarship. Earlier this year, President Joe Biden awarded Walter the National Humanities Medal, a measure of how his work as a biographer has enriched our understanding of the, these innovators who have used science and technology to change our world. On this note, I turn the podium over to the great Walter Isaacson, who will tell us something of his own journey. That was nice. That was far too nice. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, Rick, everybody. It's a great honor to be able to give the Leon Levy lecture, and Kai told me, you have to make it a lecture. We're going to publish these. So for, uh, I've tried to explain the theory of biography that Kai has just introduced and how some of us start to go down that road. My road to biography began at Time Magazine in the 1980s. Uh, the ever-present spirit of Henry Luce was there, and he had taught people at the magazine to tell the history of our time through the people who make it. He said, always put a person on the cover of time. Uh, he was accused at one point of fostering personality journalism, personality-driven journalism. And he said, no, we didn't invent that idea. The Bible did. Uh, <laughs> And when we teach lessons and craft narratives through chronicling human agency, starting with Adam and Eve, it's the best way to not only preach, but to be storytellers. And that to me, as Alice Mayhew once said, keep it narrative, keep it chronological. And I said, you know, she said, have you read the Bible? Because as you know, she was very religious in, in her own way. And she said, it has the best lead sentence ever. In the beginning, comma. <laughs> so keep things chronological. And so to me, biography became storytelling. Uh, even in the Bible with its, all of its commandments, the commandments are wrapped in stories of Moses parting the Red Sea, coming down with the tablets. And that, to me, is the best way in an era in which everybody has hot takes and going on cable TV and preaching, is that, well, maybe we should retreat and be storytellers and help forge our judgments through that way. That approach fell out of favor in the academy uh, when I was in college. I had a very beloved... Uh, professor there, young professor. Her name was then Doris Kearns. And when I was there, she was denied tenure at Harvard because her dissertation uh, was on Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream. And the faculty of the history and the political science departments looked down upon it as 
imposing a narrative on history, the great man theory of history. Uh, biography was disdained after that. Once Doris uh, didn't get tenure, you could see it ripple through the academy that this was not a great way to have a scholarly uh, career. Um, and it goes back, of course, all the great debates between you know, Thomas Carlyle and Herbert Spencer, all the way back to Plutarch. The notion of, is it people who affect the ripples of history, or is it great forces? Uh, when I first wrote about Kissinger, uh, I found an old Hugh Sidey. Some of you are old enough to remember who he was, our Washington bureau chief. And he had taken notes in an off-the-record briefing that Kissinger had done uh, on the shuttle missions. And Kissinger said, when I was a professor at Harvard, I was taught that history was only made by great forces. But now that I see it up close, I see the effect that great people have. Uh, he was sort of, I think, thinking he was talking about Sadat and Golda Meir, but I think he was actually talking about himself. <laughs> but this trend opened the way for non-academics and journalists, such as Robert Caro and others, to combine a reporter's skill, uh, notebook-carrying ability, with the ability of diving into archives to produce biographical narratives. There was a whole set of people, McCullough, Caro, and others, who benefited from the fact that biography had temporarily, it's back now, had fallen out of favor in the academy. I was covering the Ronald Reagan 1980 campaign as I first came up from New Orleans to Time Magazine, and I began to be puzzled and somewhat intrigued by these conspiratorial leaflets that were handed out on the fringe of his rallies, uh, filled with charts showing the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the establishment being the root of global evil. If we think those conspiracy theories are new, uh, certainly they go way back. Unfortunately now, the internet can amplify them, but at the time, you met weirdos on the fringe of rallies who had mimeographed these type of things. I asked Evan Thomas, who had the office next to me at time, I said, what is this establishment everybody, all these things talk about? Uh, he had gone to Andover and he was a preppy, so I figured he knew what that was. And we did decide to write a book about it, as Kai said. Uh, and over a week spent in a cottage out in Sag Harbor, we decided the best approach would be biographical. Not knowing Kai was already tilling that field, we picked McCloy, but also Atchison, Harriman, Bolin, Lovett, and George Kennan to show how six people interacted from their days at Yale and Groton all the way through Brown Brothers Harriman to the Foreign Service, and how they formed a biographical narrative who were at the heart of this mysterious circle. We walked down the street in Sag Harbor to see Alice Mayhew, not quite legendary, but almost. All the president's men was just coming out. And um, we tried to picture on this idea of six people that nobody had heard of much and doing a joint biography of how they affected the 1940s and the 50s. We thought, this is not gonna go well. And she cut us off after like two sentences. And she said, I've always wanted to publish that book. It's a prequel to the best and the brightest, and I've always wanted to call it The Wise Men. Ever since then, by the way, I have all those books you rattled off. I've never sent them out to any other publisher. It's just a quick lunch with Alice and then her successor, Priscilla Payton, and, say, and uh, I've always been loyal to Simon & Schuster. The book ended with The Wise Men visiting the White House and telling Lyndon Johnson he had to get out of Vietnam. And I wanted to follow the story from there, and so I decided to do a biography of Henry Kissinger. Um, in both books, I learned the value of combining journalistic interviews with also research in the archives. The documents and the memos of conversation in Kissinger's archives 
where, or the Library of Congress and other places, including the Council on Foreign Relations, you'd find all the documents, and they were fascinating. But when I interviewed Mort Halperin and Winston Lord and others who had actually written those memos of conversation, they told me, oh, those aren't true. Those were made up. They had been crafted by Kissinger to impress Nixon or to baffle future historians. <laughs> and on the flip side, this is a story I know you know well because it's in your book, I interviewed uh, John McCloy about the decision uh, to drop the bomb, and he told the story of being at a meeting, and at one point he said, and I told the president to be wary about dropping the bomb. I'll let Kai finish the story later. But I went through the oral histories uh, of, that McCloy had done starting in the 1950s, and I realized that he had gradually embellished that story that the earliest documents were that he wasn't even at the table uh, at the meeting. <laughs> he was just sitting on the fringe and talked afterwards to Henry Stimson, his boss. But it's what I call the, and then I told the president problem, which is when you're interviewing powerful people, you have to, it's like the half-life of uranium. Each decade, you have to discount 20% of some of their <laughs> memories. And so the lesson is that triangulating archival research with journalistic questions, even when it comes to an Einstein or somebody who's not still around, is the most important way to try to get at the truth. But after dealing with Kissinger, which was a bit exhausting, um, I decided I wanted to do somebody who had been dead more than 200 years. And uh, I was interested in the precedence, the antecedents of Kissinger's balance of power realism. And uh, there aren't that many examples in American history of balance of power realists, but I discovered how Benjamin Franklin was a rare practitioner conducting a subtle balance of power game between the Bourbon Pact nations and Britain, uh, pitting them against each other, against England, and having a realist view of the world. And one of the things I learned from researching Franklin is how important science was to him. Uh, his appreciation for Newtonian mechanics helped inform the checks and balances and balances of power uh, that he and Jefferson, also a good scientist, did. We think of Franklin as a doddering old dude, you know, flying a kite in the rain, saying, a penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, but what I found was those electricity experiments were the most important experimental discoveries of that era. Discovering the single fluid theory of electricity, plus and minus, figuring out the words, battery, condenser, uh, conductor, to describe it. And Franklin and Jefferson would have thought you were a Philistine, you would have, uh, if you didn't keep up with science. And I realized, although my father's an engineer, my uncle was an engineer, there have been scientists in my family, I realized that in our own era, we fell prey to what C.P. Snow called the two cultures, in which there's a great divide between the practitioners of the humanities and the practitioners of the sciences. You know, most of my friends, probably most people in the room, are somewhat in the latter category, more comfortable uh, in, the, uh, in the humanities. And they're always preaching. I had to give a lecture once on how in an era of STEM, we have to make sure people love arts and humanities. Uh, certainly, that is true. But when I talk to all of my friends who say how important it is to know the arts and the humanities, uh, and who will sort of applaud those lines and speeches, they would uh, make fun of anybody who didn't know Hamlet uh, from Macbeth, or uh, they would think them uncultured. But they would proclaim, almost without shame, sometimes even joking, that they don't like math, or they don't like physics. Ada Lovelace, somebody I wrote about as the framing device for the innovators, daughter of the poet, Lord Byron, and uh, if any of you know anything about Lord Byron, you know he wasn't winning the Husband of the Year trophies, so <laughs> Lady Byron uh, 
not only divorced him, but decided to make sure that Ada Byron did not follow in his footsteps. And she was tutored only in mathematics and science because Lady Byron did not want her to become a poet. But Ada developed what she called poetical science. She realized that the sciences and math are just as beautiful as any line of poetry. And she uh, knew mathematical equations uh, quite well, worked on calculus, and people said, well, how can you do that? That's complicated. Those are difficult. And she would say, she walked in beauty like the night. Or she would quote one of the lines of her father's poetry and say, that's difficult too but a mathematical equation is just as beautiful and we should all work with it. One reason that science became more mysterious and that the two cultures developed is that in the days of Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson, the same century as Newton, Newton is pretty easy. You could figure out force and mass and acceleration. You could figure out the balances of Newtonian's two or three great laws. But then Einstein comes along, and suddenly science is filled with relativity, is filled with uncertainty, spooky action at a distance, and almost uh, out of a, a sense that we all have to love the beauty of science again, I, I decided to do a biography of Einstein to demystify the science, to make it a narrative tale of a patent clerk trying to figure out how to synchronize clocks at a distance with light beams or radio waves being sent between the two clocks and the trains outside of the patent office racing one way or the other and discovering the notion that if you're in motion, what's synchronized will look different. Therefore, time is relative, but the speed of light is constant. Don't worry, it's, you don't have to get it right away. He didn't get uh, his doctorate for another four years because science uh, at the time hadn't caught up with him. But it was a way to use biographical narrative to demystify science. Uh, and that became something that I felt was a road that I could hoe better. I'm not going to outdo Meacham and presidents or Kai and grand leaders. But of course, Kai has done a great scientist, Einstein's friend Oppenheimer. Uh, seeing a pa uh, seeking a pattern in my wandering choices, I asked my young daughter, which she thought, and she reminded me that all biography is autobiography. And I think Emerson said it, but I like attributing it to my daughter. Um, and uh, she said I wrote about Franklin because I was writing about myself, a you know somewhat ambitious, upwardly striving journalist who aspired to be involved in public policy and like technology. And I said, well, why did I do Einstein? He said, well, that's your dad, meaning my father who's the engineer. And, um, and I said, okay, what was I doing when I wrote about Kissinger? And she said, oh, Dad, you were writing about your dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I finished my biography of Einstein, Steve Jobs, I went into him at an event for it, and he asked to go for a walk, and he said, do me next. <laughs> I thought, okay, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, Steve, uh, and, my, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, you arrogant. But, and I said, okay, I'll, you know, maybe, but let's wait 30 years until you retire. But then somebody in his family a few days later told me, if you're going to do Steve, you have to do him now, and explained he had cancer. I said, well, I didn't know that. He said, no, he's keeping it secret, but he called you, he met with you the day after he was diagnosed. And so... I felt that once again, it was a way to help demystify the entry into the digital age and the business. A person who had affected history more than all the wise men and presidents and others. And I uh, felt that I would have the opportunity to get up close and do just a pure narrative biography. When I asked why he wanted me to do the book, he said there was a theme that ran through all my books which I didn't know, which is that innovation comes from those who stand at the intersection of the arts and the sciences, those who stand at the intersection of humanity and technology. If you ever saw one of his great product launches, it always ends with the slide of two street signs, uh, the arts 
and technology, or uh, sometimes the humanity and the sciences. And he says, he said, when he introduced the iPad, he showed that slide, he said, it's in Apple's DNA that technology is not enough. We believe it's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities, that makes the results that allow our heart to sing. Um, he told me afterwards that I had to do Leonardo da Vinci. He said that was, he argued, that was the ultimate of somebody who thought of himself both as an engineer and an artist. And indeed, if you read uh, one of the greatest job application letters in the history of humanity, when Leonardo has failed to finish some of his commissions in Florence and he's a misfit, uh, decides to go off to Milan and he writes the Duke of Milan an 11 paragraph letter and he says, I can build bridges, I can make great buildings, I can divert the, co only in the 11th paragraph, he says, I can also paint. <laughs> uh, but if you look at that drawing of Vitruvian Man, you know, the naked guy doing jumping jacks in the circle and square, it's the ultimate expression of connecting the humanities and the science. Uh, through these walk backs into history, Einstein, Franklin, and Leonardo, it was not only discovering the joys of archives, I discovered uh, the joys of knowing somebody through the thousands of letters and diaries and writings and journal entries that they did. Way back then from Leonardo, we still have 7,200 pages of his notebooks extant. Uh, likewise, uh, Ben Franklin, 40 volumes that were then all in the Yale Beinecke Library now have been published. Same with Einstein. You could see that every day they wrote letters, every day they wrote memos, uh, something, of course, that we've lost. Um, and all of those journals and uh, texts and notebooks are still accessible after 500 years, in Leonardo's case, or 250 years after uh, Ben Franklin's case. But our emails and our tweets and our digital documents and our text messages probably won't be there, perhaps mercifully, for historians 50 or 100 years from now. When I was working with Jobs, he wrote memos in the 1990s trying to figure out what he was gonna do when he was ousted from Apple, and he created the Next computer, it was called Next. And all of his emails and all of his documents were in this computer, this next computer that he had downstairs. He had moved his bedroom downstairs because he couldn't walk upstairs. And he tried to retrieve all those emails. And even with the tech department at Apple coming over, he could not retrieve the emails he had written in the 1990s. My point is that paper turns out to be a really great information storage technology. It has an infinite battery life and an operating system that never becomes obsolete. Leonardo was a precursor of the scientific revolution and it made me think about the various tech and science driven revolutions of our time. I had a wonderful professor, Steve Shapin, uh, and once again, this is one of those things about historiography. Do you believe that there are things like the Renaissance and revolutions, or is everything just actually evolutionary and there aren't big breaks in history? Uh, and Steve Shapin wrote a book called, the, uh, uh, the title was A Scientific Revolution, and um, his first sentence was, the scientific revolution did not exist, and this is a book about it. So uh, I, I do like seeing how science can make revolutions in our lives. There have been three in modern times, and they arise from the discovery a century ago of three fundamental kernels of existence. The atom, the bit, meaning the binary digit for, that can encode information, and the gene. In the first half of the 20th century, uh, driven by Einstein's four papers in 1905, uh, was a revolution driven by physics. It gave us everything from the bomb uh, to uh, lasers to semiconductors. 
uh, nuclear power, and even radar and space travel. Second half of the 20th century was an information technology era based on the idea that all information could be encoded in these binary digits known as bits, and all logical processes could be performed by circuits with on-off switches. I tell my kids, at, uh, students at Tulane that they have to understand what a circuit is. When they use their iPhone, they have to figure out how you do logic with yes, no answers and on-off switches, because that's all a transistor is. Um, when these innovations were combined, the microchip, the transistor, the internet, the computer, uh, that you had this new digital revolution. And biographically, that's what I had tried to do with Steve Jobs. I realized after that that we're entering a third and perhaps even more consequential revolution in our lives that is driven by science. Children who study digital coding will be joined by those who actually study genetic coding. And that's why I wrote about Jennifer Doudna and the role of discovering the gene editing technology known as CRISPR. Uh, it'll allow us to, as today when I got my uh, messenger RNA shot from Pfizer or from Walgreens, it'll allow us to use RNA as a molecule and program it just like it were a microchip. And we can use it to edit our genes, to make spike proteins that'll give us our immune system. Uh, after it was finished, a friend arranged a phone call with Elon Musk. Um, we had talked for a couple of hours and I realized that he was also in the forefront of two of the most consequential scientific and technological innovations of our time. First, the revival of space travel. Uh, 50 years earlier, we'd gone to the moon, but then quit trying to, and 20, you know, we grounded the shuttle, and we're no longer sending astronauts to orbit. And with SpaceX, he was able to send astronauts into orbit. And secondly, he was single-handedly, almost, pushing the transition to electric vehicles and solar-powered roofs that would connect to the batteries. That was right after General Motors and Ford got out of the EV business and quit making electric vehicles. Um, I said to him that, you know, we talked for quite a while. I said, I'd like to do the book, but I don't want to do it based on five or 10 interviews, or if even 15 interviews. I want to do something that our patron, St. Boswell, did with Dr. Johnson, which is be by your, you know, I wanted to be by his side for two years maybe every third week, just go out for a full week, morning, noon, and night, and just observe and write the book uh, by writing alongside him rather than doing interviews with him. He's a prickly individual, and it was easier just to watch than to try to engage him in interviews. <laughs> and I said, so I'll do it if you can let me shadow you for two years. Uh, he went, okay, in that monotone he sometimes has. And I said, um, and the other condition is, you have no control over it. I knew he was a control freak. You're not even gonna get to read it in advance. You're not gonna get an advanced copy, you can buy it the day it comes out. <laughs> and surprisingly, he went, okay. Uh, we were at, some of you know Joel Klein and Nicole Seligman, I'm sure half the room, no, everybody. It's like if you do six degrees of separation, you can't use Joel and Nicole Seligman because everybody knows them. We were their house guests. We, Kathy and I have become known as America's guest since we don't have a place uh, in Long Island. And I went downstairs and there were people hanging out and everybody started saying, oh my God, you're doing Elon Musk. I said, yeah, how did you know? I haven't even told you know, Priscilla yet. I said, oh, he just tweeted out, Walter is writing my biography. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I guess I'm gonna have to do it. Uh, unfortunately for me, what I thought was a technology book involving batteries and electric cars and spaceships and Raptor engines turned out to be a rockier ride, especially when a year into it, he secretly, he told me he was secretly buying Twitter stock. Went to Hawaii with one of his girlfriends, Natasha Bassett, and stayed up three nights in a row and decided to 
uh, make a hostile offer. And then, I mean, he's got a complex life, then flew to Vancouver, where Claire Boucher, known as Grimes, was there, mother of three of his kids. And they played Elden Ring till 5.30 in the morning. And at 5.35, he sends out a message, I made an offer. So that kind of changed the narrative of the book. And it showed the demons, as any of you who have seen, I try to show the brilliance, and I know a lot of people just hate him so badly that uh, you, it's hard to get your head around the fact that somehow he's been able to make rockets work that NASA and Boeing and other countries can. He's been able to land them upright and reuse them, which nobody's been able to do. But he's also a very dark and difficult individual. And so that became a more complex biography and a more complex situation for me. Um, and like a lot of people, uh, one key to understanding him was his relationship with his father. I think there's a rule of biography of powerful men or even of Jennifer Doudna that it's true that they have to come to terms with some difficulties as feeling a misfit or a father. Uh, some, I think Obama's first paragraph says, uh, someone once said that every man is trying to live up to his father or make up for his father's sins, and that explains me. Nixon, the first sentence of his memoir is more succinct, even though I don't know if he knew what he was intending to say, but he simply said, I was born in a house my father built. And I think we're all born in houses that our parents built. And for Musk, uh, he was the most misfit of all of our, the characters I've written about. I mentioned Leonardo, who in the village of Vinci was left-handed, illegitimate. His father refuses to legitimate him. He's gay, he's distracted. And that feeling of a misfit as he wanders off to Florence uh, helps him be enough of an outsider that I think is one of the forces. It's true of Benjamin Franklin, who runs away from being indentured uh, to his brother. Uh, it's true of Steve Jobs, who was uh, put up for adoption by a father he never knew and then had to go through a second round of adoptions. Uh, and uh, all of them, I think, felt a little bit like outsiders. Um, as a kid in South Africa, Musk also had the problem of being the youngest, the smallest, the scrawniest kid in his class. And as he said, he's on the autism spectrum, which does not necessarily excuse his behavior, but it shows why he has difficulty with emotional receptors. He's just really bad at either empathy or even faking empathy, uh, or picking up social cues. Uh, and as a result, he was regularly beaten up by the bullies who would come up and just punch him in the face. At one point in the playground of his school, a student was horsing around and just started beating Musk up and pushing him down the concrete steps of the school and beat his face so badly that Musk was in the hospital for four days. But the scars from that were minor compared to the psychological scars of his very dark Jekyll and Hyde father. And when he came home from the hospital, his father made him stand erect for two hours while the father, Errol Musk, told him he was a loser, told him he was a failure, told him he was stupid, and took the side of the boy who had beat up Elon Musk. Uh, and in some ways, uh, the impact on his psyche lingered. Those demons, you can still watch them come out. His mother, May Musk, some of you may know, lives in here in Manhattan, uh, obviously divorced Errol pretty soon, but said, here's the theme of your book. Elon's struggle is to not become his father. And indeed, you see at times this a split personality, this Jekyll and Hyde, even this multiple personality close to being a disorder in which Musk can be inspiring, totally brilliant at engineering, funny, 
charming, also dark and mean and cold and totally lacking in empathy. Um, it's one of the most resonant tropes in literature, starting with Aeschylus and uh, Sophocles, all the way through uh, Luke Skywalker having to fight the dark side of the fourth and force and finding out that Darth Vader is his father. Uh, and with a childhood like that in South Africa, his first wife Justine says, you shut yourself down emotionally. Now here's a problem biographers had, and I've certainly had it with this one, which is if you try to explain somebody's behavior, and if you try to understand his behavior, people think you're excusing that behavior, which is difficult because I'm trying to tell it as a story, I'm trying to let readers make judgments, but I'm also trying to figure out the roots of a particular type of behavior. And this shut off valve that he had that his first wife talks about uh, made him callous, but it also made him an incredible risk taker. He shut off fear, according to his second wife, to Lula Riley. And if you shut off fear, you have to turn off other things, like empathy. So out of this cauldron, Musk developed an aura that made him seem at times almost like an alien, as if his Mars mission were some desire to return home. Uh, but his childhood also made him all too human, a tough yet vulnerable and cold man-child who decided to embark on epic quests. He had a fervor that cloaked his goofiness and a goofiness that would cloak his fervor. And with the conviction of a prophet, he would speak of his three great missions in life. He said that as a lonely kid, he would go to the bookstore or the library every day because he had no friends, and he would sit in the corner and he'd either read the comic books or sci-fi, like many geeks. Uh, and I think he read them far too often because he said, it was amazing to me, the heroes in those comic books, they were trying to save the world, but they wore their underpants on the outside, <laughs> so they looked ridiculous. And then he said, but at least they were trying to save the world. And almost too, that's an image of a guy like Musk, who at times can be both ridiculous and totally uh, problematic is a polite way to say it, but also truly believing that he was on epic missions. At first I thought these were the type of pontifications you do at a pep talk for your team or on a podcast, but he would recite these so often, I think he truly had eternalized them. Um, the first, with the conviction of a prophet, is he would talk about human consciousness and how it's important that we fathom the nature of the universe. This is from reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy three times or something. Um, and he felt that in order to preserve human consciousness, we had to become multi-planetary. We had to become adventurous again. We had to become risk takers again. We were a society that had more, suddenly had everybody in America, in some ways, or most people, took risks whether they came over on the Mayflower or they came across the Rio Grande. But he said, now we have more referees and regulators than we have risk takers. So he said his first mission was to get humanity to be multi-planetary. The second was to sustain energy on this planet through electric vehicles, solar roofs, and power walls. And his third, from reading Asimov, was that artificial intelligence and robots could turn upon us and we have to have a safe AI. We have to develop a safe artificial intelligence. He, in doing these things, he had a compulsion to stir up dramas. When I first started working with him, or covering him, he said he had become, I thought, okay, this is gonna be a pretty easy book. We know it wrapped up. He had just become, I don't know if Rick, you made him this person of the year at Time Magazine. He had become person of the year for the Financial Times. He had become the richest person on the planet. No other company was able to launch rockets and then land them and reuse them, but he had done it 30 times that year. 
He was the only person who had been able to send American astronauts from the US into orbit. And he had sold a million Teslas and led us into the era of electric vehicles. And I thought, okay, you're gonna rest on your laurels. We have this book and he said, I need to shift my mindset away from drama, from being in crisis mode, which it has been for the past 14 years, or maybe since I was a kid on the playground. Uh, it was a wistful comment. It wasn't the New Year's re resolution because as he told me then, he was starting to buy uh, Twitter. And he decided to make, after that all night session of Elden Ring, a hostile tender offer. There are many reasons he did it. He wanted to turn Twitter back into what he had created 20 years earlier called X.com, which was a payments platform that became PayPal. But when they ousted him and renamed it PayPal, he'd always harbored the vision of having a payments platform connected to a social media platform connected uh, to content creation and payment for it. And I think that's a good vision, but I'd never challenge him on things, but I'd ask him questions. I'd say, well, do you have a feel for how to run a social network, social media? He said, well, Twitter is basically an engineering problem. It's a technology, and they haven't upgraded the technology. And I thought to myself, I think I actually say it in the book, no, Twitter is not a technology uh, company. It's not an engineering problem. It is an advertising medium that gathers eyeballs of people in what should be a friendly environment so that advertisers can be in a place where people are happy. And he had no feel for doing that. He kept talking on, as if he were on a mission on free speech, but as you can tell, it was somewhat hypocritical because it was free speech except for when people really disagreed with him. But also I'd ask him questions like, why is free speech good? Rick and I have talked about this a lot, but we all say we're in favor of free speech, but we have to think back. Is it because we think it'll get us closer to the truth? If both sides or all sides have fair play? Yes, maybe, but sometimes it doesn't, as the internet has proven. Is it because we think it's better for democracy? Maybe, maybe not. We're in favor of free speech because we like individual autonomy and we like people to have their own uh, autonomy and liberty, but he hadn't thought it through that deeply, and he was just wildly opening the platform to more speech. And so it becomes, as I said, a more complicated tale than just the kid shooting off rocket ships and making batteries. You know, from Kissinger to, certainly Kissinger, to Leonardo, to Jobs, to Musk, all of the characters I've written about have had flashes of genius, with also displays of darkness. In Musk's case, it's at least one order of magnitude or maybe two greater. But in all cases, people are complex. We do in biography as we do in life. We learn to admire a person's good traits and recoil from their bad ones. That's pretty easy to do. In the book, I show the good and bad traits, and it's clear what I think are good and bad. You can call it the Thomas Jefferson conundrum. I mean, how somebody could write a sentence that say, we hold these truths, but then also write, and all men are created equal, while he enslaved people. We judge people not only, though, by toting up and balancing their strengths and failings, virtues and flaws. We also look at their moral trajectory sometimes. Even genial Benjamin Franklin, when he was a young tradesman, had two slaves working in his shop. But he came to understand the horrors of enslavement and became the patron of a school for young blacks, patron of the society uh, to uh, educate freed slaves. And in his 80s, which back then was considered old, um, he became the president of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery. Thus he becomes emblematic of a moral arc a country has had to travel. But admiring a person's good traits while de decrying their bad ones is simple compared to the more complex challenge of understanding sometimes how those strands uh, weave together, 
how they might be tightly interwoven. They might be inextricable. You can't say, let's take away Musk's Twitter feed and take away his dark tweets and take away his bad political things, but also keep the impulsive person who shoots off three rockets, all of which explode, and as he's going bankrupt, gets the fourth attempt and turns into SpaceX. You know, Shakespeare teaches us all of our heroes have flaws, some tragic, some conquered, and those that we cast as villains, even they are often complex. As Shakespeare wrote, even the best, he said, are molded out of faults. It's a great scene at the end of Measure for Measure. Nobody ever gets to the end of that play because it's almost unreadable. But if you get to the end, it's, they say the best men are molded out of faults and for the most become more the better for being a little bad. And the question is, can you separate out those strands? Or are some of the dark strands actually the demons that turn into drives that turn somebody successful? One of the great biographies, I'm not sure you've given him the award of the past decade to me, was George Packer on Holbrook. Anybody like yourself who is, has he gotten the award yet? I nominate him. Um, <laughs> many of you kind of knew Holbrook. Uh, Holbrook was a person of incredible appetites, ambitions, darkness, maneuvering, and manipulativeness that also made him a force of nature when it came to diplomacy. After, when I was writing Jennifer Doudna, the code breaker, about gene editing, a lot of the meetings that she had were at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, where James Watson had been the chief for many, many years. And James Watson still lived at a house. They hadn't been able to kick him out. But for about 15 years ago, he became racist or a belief that genetics are, uh, that there's a racial, uh, a genetic component to IQ and that, you know, all these, you know, the theories there. And his son, who's also like one of Musk's sons, very artistic, happens to be very wise because he is so, and said, you can't blame my father if he didn't believe so much in the power of the double helix and genetics, he wouldn't have discovered the structure of DNA. But it also has made him a dark person. He's still, I'm still in touch with him. He's one of those people who's very uh, good mind, but a bad uh, view. And someday somebody's gonna have to write about those interwoven things. It made me think on this issue about gene editing, about how we can edit our DNA to get rid of certain unwanted traits. We can get rid of sickle cell anemia. We can get rid of, start thinking of other things. You know, hair color we could change, maybe sexual orientation we could change. How far are we gonna go down that dark path by saying we're gonna pull out some of the genes we don't like and try to create designer babies. And you realize, if you study it, that the genes are all very interwoven. If you cut out the gene that um, changes, uh, if you cut out one of the genes on sickle cell, it makes you more susceptible to malaria. So we don't know how these strands genetically or uh, psychologically get interwoven. In cases like Musk, I think the better uh, metaphor is an alloy rather than a gene uh, or strands woven together. He had a real feel for material science and how the compounds uh, of, of a alloy uh, draw their strength from their combination. A combination of elements that comes together and produce properties that don't exist when you pull out any one of those elements. There are very few unalloyed players on history's stage, and that's particularly true of innovators. Those misfits, those rebels, as Steve Jobs said, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square hole, the ones who think different. Because the people who are crazy enough 
to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So most are complex compounds of elements from arsenic to iron, the source of their tensile strength and of their weaknesses can involve the most difficult mixes of chemistry and physics. Not all steel is stainless. And I ended up trying to learn how to deal with this, not by telling you what to think. It was like, how should I handle this? Back when I did Steve Jobs, even Kissinger. And my approach, to get back to the beginning and to Kai's introduction, is do it through storytelling. Do it through the way the Bible does. The very first biography I read when I was about 15 years old, real biography, because uh, I even then didn't even know you could be a biographer, was, most of you will know of it, T. Harry Williams, his biography of Huey Long. It has a great opening scene. It's about Huey Long, the governor of Louisiana, who's from upstate, you know, Protestant, Baptist, upstate Louisiana. And he's going down to speak in Cajun country where there's all the Catholics there, and they warn him, you know, there's this religious divide in Louisiana. And Huey gets on the stump, and he says, you know, when I was young, we used to, I used to have to hitch a horse to the wagon to take my Baptist grandmother to church. And then when I came back, I'd rehitch the horse back to the wagon and I'd take my Catholic grandmother to mass. And his advisor comes up after and said, you know, Governor Long, you never told us you had a Catholic grandmother. He says, hell, we didn't even have a horse. <laughs> you laugh, but it's T. Harry Williams' way of saying he's a liar, he's a rogue. He's a rogue you can kind of laugh at, but he's somebody who's opportunity. And T. Harry Williams didn't have to preach. He just had to begin with that story. So ever since then, there have been six magic words. I think Arthur Haley once used it, others did, but I actually have written it down the way some people write their mantra. Is whenever I get stuck, whenever I have a difficult thing to express, whenever I have to figure out how to deal with an Elon Musk thing, the six words, the magic words are, let me tell you a story. And I'll drop back. If you, if you read the book, you'll see almost every section, almost every paragraph sort of begins with a story. None of them quite as good of hell we didn't even have a horse, but they're stories that help you try to understand it. And it comes down to what my mentor, when I was young as a budding writer, uh, was a great novelist from Louisiana. Walker Percy. And we as kids never quite knew what Uncle Walker did for a living. We would we used to go, uh, he lived on the Bogafalaya, one of the bayous north of the city. And we'd go with his daughter Anne fishing or skiing or something. Sam, what does your dad do? He's always sitting on the dock drinking bourbon and eating hard said cheese. And she said, well, he's a writer. And I, I, I knew you could be an engineer like my dad or a fisherman, but I didn't know you could be, quote, a writer. And at one point, I read his first book when it finally came out. I was about 12. It's called The Movie Goer. And I was a little bit baffled. It was a wonderful piece of storytelling, just of a week leading up to Ash Wednesday with a guy named Bing Spohn. But there were messages in it. It was religious, spiritual messages, but I didn't quite get it. I remember sitting on the dock with Dr. Percy and saying, I've read the book, and you seem to be wanting to teach us something. You seem to have lessons in there, spiritual ones. And what are they? He said, he just shook his head. He said, there are two types of people who come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. This world's got far too many preachers. <laughs> so thank you all very much. <laughs> no, what